So greetings from Tokyo once again. Welcome to session three of the forum. We begin this session with a presentation by Mr. Kaneko Osamu, Director General of the Civil Affairs Bureau of the Ministry of Justice of Japan. Mr. Kaneko's own original and professional background is a judge of Japanese courts, but he has extensive experience engaging in domestic civil law reform as a justice ministry official. Mr. Kaneko, the floor is yours. Please proceed to the podium. Good afternoon and good morning, distinguished guests and participants. I'm Kaneko Osamu, Director General of the Civil Affairs Bureau with the Japanese Ministry of Justice. At the outset, I would like to ex extend my greetings to Ms. Anna Jubambare, the Secretary of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and Ms. Meg Kinier, the Secretary General of the International Center for Settlement of Investment in Disputes. I'm delighted for this opportunity to deliver my remarks at this forum, which has been successfully held despite the challenges we face. The Civil Affairs Bureau has a close and long-standing relationship with ANSTRAL. I have fond memories delivering opening remarks at the symposium in 2015, which was held here in Tokyo, to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. With the participation of the then head of the Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific of Anstral. Conventions and the model laws of Anstral have influenced Japanese civil and commercial laws. For example, Japan concluded the Convention on the Recognition and the Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, that is New York Convention and CISG. Japan's laws on arbitration and cross-border insolvency are based on the ancestral model laws. Our bureau is also certainly aware of the extremely important work being carried out by ICSID in the field of dispute settlement. This August, the government of Japan designated four members to the panel of arbitrators and conciliators of ICSID respectively. As a result of extensive coordination in which our bureau was heavily involved, the Ministry of Justice is committed to further supporting ICSID's work. Today, I would like to provide an overview of the latest developments in Japan in the field of arbitration and mediation. Let me begin by introducing the recent developments regarding arbitration. International arbitration is globally recognized as one of the common methods for settling international commercial disputes. However, in Japan, where domestic court proceedings have long been trusted as the most reliable dispute resolution mechanism, the situation seems to be different. Arbitration has not received as much attention as in other parts of the world. It is, however, noteworthy that there are commercial disputes which may be better resolved through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, and that revamping various dispute settlement options will, contrib will contribute to strengthening dispute resolution as a whole. Therefore, in recent years, the promotion of international arbitration has become an important policy issue in Japan. In line with this policy to promote international arbitration, the government of Japan, in close cooperation with the private sector, is taking necessary steps to improve the necessary infrastructure for arbitration, including through one, the establishment of special facilities designated for arbitration, two, outreach to domestic and foreign companies, and three, uh, training arbitration practitioners. Alongside, when the parties in dispute choose the place of arbitration, domestic laws of that place is obviously a matter of great concern. Accordingly, to promote international arbitration, it would be essential for domestic laws 
to be in line with the latest international standards, such as ancestral conventions and the modern laws relating to arbitration. From this viewpoint, the Civil Affairs Bureau, which is the office responsible for legis legis legislative matters on civil and commercial laws, is exploring possible amendments to the Arbitration Act. Based on the ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration, the Arbitration Act was established and enacted in 2003. This act replaced the old Act on Arbitration enacted in 1890, so as to modernize the rules and modernize the rules and to make them consistent with internationally recognized standards. In principle, we consider that the rules provided for in the Arbitration Act is comparable to global standards. However, as the Arbitration Act was enacted while work on the amendment to the model law was ongoing in Anstral, some parts of the Arbitration Act are not in conformity with the 2006 model law. There have been calls to update the Arbitration Act based on the latest model law. Against this backdrop, in September last year, the Minister of Justice consulted the Legis Legislative Council of the Ministry of Justice about the review of the legal systems related to arbitration. Subsequently, the Legis Legislative Council established the Arbitration Working Group to conduct research and study to fulfill, to fulfill its mandate. In the Arbitration Working Group, there was general consensus in terms of the need to revise the Arbitration Act to reflect the updated rules of the 2006 model law and the concrete rules were discussed in line with this general understanding. After deliberation by the working group in October this year, the Legislative Council finalized an outline suggesting possible amendments to the Arbitration Act and reported to the Minister of Justice on the outline. Let me briefly explain the main points put forward by the outline. First, the outline suggests that the Ar Arbitration Act clarify the definition and the con conditions for interim measures and provide rules for the enforcement of interim measures through court proceedings. Second, the outline suggests providing pro flexibility in terms of the form of arbitration agreements, namely the in writing requirement, so as to comply with the 2006 model law. In addition, regarding court procedures, such as procedures for setting aside arbitral awards, execution order of arbitral awards, and examination of evidence, the outline suggests that the Arbitration Act provides that the courts may exempt parties from supplying translations of arbitral awards and documentary evidence made in foreign languages with the aim of increasing the friendliness of Japanese court, court proceedings in the context of international arbitration. Furthermore, the outline suggests providing additional jurisdictions for the Tokyo District District Court and the Osaka District, District Court, so as to establish specialized divisions to handle procedures concerning arbitration. Following this outline, we will be preparing draft provisions to amend the Arbitration Act, which will be presented to the parliament at the earliest possible timing. Now let me move on to the next topic, that is the recent developments regarding mediation. Japan has a long history of court mediation, which dates back to about 100 years ago in 1922. Court mediation started in the field of real estate matters and then expanded its scope to agricultural, commercial, mining pollution, and general civil matters. 
if we looked back furthermore, even in the Edo period, which lasted from 1603 to 1868, there was a dispute resolution system called Naisai, which was similar to mediation. As such, we can say achieving dispute settlement through parties' agreement is hist historically ingrained in Japan's dispute resolution system. In 2020, about 30,000 civil mediation cases and about 130,000 family mediation cases were filed to Japanese courts. Mediation is a very it, mediation is a system very familiar to the Japanese people. Concerning private mediation, namely mediation conducted by actors other than courts, since the act on promotion of use of alternative, distribute, alternative dispute resolution entered into force in 2007, many cases have been carried out by private dispute resolution operators. As of October the 1st this year, while there are 162 private dispute resolution operators certified by the Minister of Justice, only 1,485 cases were dealt with by these operators. The number of private mediation cases is far below that of court mediation cases. Aside from the trustworthiness of the Japanese judiciary, it is pointed out that one of the reasons for the sparse use of private mediation is that settlement agreements resulting from private mediation are not in themselves enforceable. Whereas settlement agreements resulting from court mediation are enforceable. While the issue of enforceability of mediated settlement agreements in general remains unresolved, international mediation is attracting particular attention as a useful method for settling international commercial disputes in an expedited and flexible manner. The advantages of international mediation have been highlighted, especially by the COVID-19 pandemic and acknowledging that arbitration and mediations are both means to settle disputes and that both are seamlessly used in some cases. Solely promoting arbitration does not seem to be the right approach. In 2020, the Act on Special Measures concerning the handling of legal services by foreign lawyers was amended to respond to the increasing needs of foreign law services, as well as to contribute to the promotion of international arbitration. This amendment introduced rules for international mediation cases in which foreign lawyers may act as a counsel. In 2018, the Japan International Mediation Center, JIMC Kyoto, was opened by private entities as the first institution dedicated to international mediation in Japan. The adoption of the United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements resulting from mediation, that is Singapore Convention, was indeed very timely as it occurred when we were seeing these developments in Japan. Japan has historically embraced the culture of wa in Japanese meaning harmony. It is for this very reason that mediation has long been ingrained in Japan's dispute resolution system. As such, I'm convinced that Japan should be able to lead the world in the field of international mechanism, international mediation. To conclude international agreements, including a Singapore Singapore Convention, ensuring domestic implementation is a prerequisite. In this regard, the Ministry of Justice is carrying out work to identify specific inconsistencies between Japan's domestic laws and the Singapore Convention 
and put forward options which may be necessary to ensure their consistency with the objective of promoting mediation in mind. The aforementioned arbitration working group is also carrying out work on the enforcement of settlement agreements resulting from mediation. With a view to taking steps necessary to conclude the Singapore Convention, the arbitration working group is contemplating the formulation of rules for the enforcement of settlement agreements resulting from international mediation and to ensure the consistency between the rules for international mediation and domestic mediation. It is also discussing setting forth similar rules for the enforcement of settlement agreements resulting from domestic mediation. It has been a great pleasure to provide an overview of the latest developments in Japan in the field of arbitration and mediation. Both arbitration and mediation are important methods for settling international commercial disputes. Arbitration and mediation are becoming frequently used as essential components of a seamless dispute resolution. Essential as essential components of a seamless dispute resolving process. This close relationship between arbitration and mediation is undeniable. Hence, we believe that it is essential to promote arbitration hand in hand with mediation. We will continue to make efforts to contribute to the field of international dispute settlement. In conclusion, on behalf of the Ministry of Justice, I wish to express my sincere appreciation to the endeavors of Anstrol and exit in the field of dispute resolution. We very much look forward to further collab collaboration with, the, with both intergovernmental bodies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Kaneko. Taking adv advantage of this opportunity, if I may ask, what do you expect of the stock taking project proposed by Japan? And how do you think Japan can actually contribute to the project in terms of substance? Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Takashima. Uh, the stocking, stock taking project is expected to enhance confidence of dispute resolution mechanisms in the context of digitalization and digitization. As I referred to in my presentation, Japan's experience in arbitration and some forms of alternative dispute resolution might not be as abundant as in other jurisdictions. I nonetheless think that dispute resolution in general, in general have common principles which need to be preserved. Given the large volume of transactions, Japan obviously has wealth of experience in dispute resolution, including those, including those in domestic courts and would be well placed to contribute based on its expertise and experience in the field. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Kaneko. According to the program, we have a short interval here. Now is perhaps the right timing to play the recording of Professor Amy Schmidt's presentation. Uh, this will be a continuation of the session uh, of session one in day one. Uh, Professor Smith's presentation is on the need to address the drawbacks of ODRs. And if this presentation is relevant in light of the recent progress made by IGLIPS, an in initiative um, led by Ancetral and Hong Kong SAR, the Department of Justice. So please, the recording. So good afternoon, Amy. Uh... I know that you're very enthusiastic about ODR and there is a lot of excitement and expectations about online dispute resolutions and or platforms that provide for cross-border dispute resolution services and their potential advantages. But you have focused your literature on the other side of the coin on the downside or the disadvantages. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on this? 
Yeah, absolutely. First of all, good afternoon. And thank you so much for letting me be a part of this event virtually. Um, I, yes, I think it's important when we think about something we care about, right? So if you care about the law or you care about due process, or in this case, you care about online dispute resolution, um, in order for it to be strong, for it to be successful, for it to actually be helpful for solving problems and resolving disputes, I think it's important to be aware of the downsides and the dangers. Um, there's promise and pitfalls to ODR. Um, I think it's very important to realize what are some of those dangers. And, and I think we see that as kind of online dispute resolution has grown by leaps and bounds. And we watch the proliferation of additional providers continually going on scene and coming out and selling us their products and services. Well, we, as those who are using and consuming those services, need to understand um, what are some of the dangers in order to promote the rule of law, to promote due process, fairness, and to use ODR for the best manner possible. So yes, I've written about the dangers of digitizing due process, as I call it, um, and also about things we need to research and be aware of um, when it comes to online dispute resolution programs. Now, do you think there is the need for any ethical standards or standard rules to govern ODR? And if such standards were to be prepared, would they mainly apply to ODR service providers? Or would they also apply to decision makers on such platforms? Who else would be governed by that? Yeah, what would be the main obligations to respect due process, as you mentioned? Or is it going to be more focused on a quick and a fair resolution, which is one of the benefits of ODR? Right. So excellent questions. And um, I'm going to sort of take them in turn in the sense that there's really a broad scope of issues to consider here. And if we go back historically um, with UNC Trial Working Group 3 that started in 2012 and ended in 2016, there was discussion at that time to start building ethical guardrails or best practices or possibly standards around ODR. At the same time, it's important historically for people to understand that the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution did put out some ethical standards, and you can find those at odr.info and see that there is movement in that direction because there are particular issues that are of concern. For example, consent, right? And that would be really something around how the platform itself is built and what is provided through that platform. So when we talk about ethical standards, to answer the first question, I will say yes, there's a need for some sort of guardrails or standards, whatever you want to call them. But whatever it be, we need to do that in order to promote a healthy use of ODR, ODR that is effective and fair. Now, next, who should be under these rules or standards? Um, I think we might have different rules for different um, parties, right? And this actually did come up with UNSU Trial Working Group 3. Um, there was a discussion about platforms versus providers um, versus those that are actually um, using the uh, as perhaps an online mediator. Um, the, these are different constituencies, and they might have different ethical rules depending on their role in ODR. And this is being considered currently by the ODR task force. What it is, is a grouping, the American Bar Association, in conjunction with the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, which is really international. We have members who are fellows from all over the world. And then of course, ICODER, which is the International Council for ODR. So you have all of these groups working together on these um, different ethical standards for ODR. And they are looking at different constituencies. For example, the providers. Some examples include Matterhorn, Modria, which was bought up by Tyler Technologies. You have Crack out of India. You have a lot of these very large providers. And they might provide online mediation, online arbitration, um, different sorts of things. They may even use algorithms. They may use different sorts of technologies. Now, you also have, as you note, we have the actual dispute resolution individuals, the professionals that are using an online system. Again, they may have different ethical considerations that are different from the provider. 
And these are things that we are considering because there's different questions that you have to ask depending on the role, the role that the company or the indiv individual is playing within the platform. In fact, there's also a third subgroup, um, and this came up with the ODR task force, which is the courts. And the subgroup of the courts is particularly important in the age of COVID, because one thing we have seen, and in fact, um, I've tracked this myself and looked at the exponential growth, is court ODR programs, meaning you now have courts throughout the world that are using these different ODR programs in order to more efficiently resolve disputes. And so we've also been talking about ethical standards that should apply specifically to the courts as well. And so you're seeing this movement happening. And, and also, I know there's counterparts in Canada and elsewhere that are working on these same issues. Now, in international arbitration, uh, it is the arbitrators who have the duty to actually provide for due process and a fair trial. You know, we're hearing that AI would have an increasing role in the decision-making process in the ODR platforms. And would you think that the standards that you mentioned would also be applicable to such developments? Oh, you absolutely have to think about data and you have to think about AI. And, and even if you're talking about, for example, to, just to be very concrete, for example, um, let's say you have an arbitrator who's working with the ICC or whoever it might be. Now, you might have standards as an arbitrator, but if that arbitrator is using an ICC platform, now you have the platform also has different duties in order to promote, for example, privacy within the confines of that ODR process. Similarly, once you introduce a certain use of data analytics, and data analytics can include everything from just algorithms, static algorithms to actually using artificial intelligence and going beyond algorithms to machine learning. And yes, there is a growing, growing use and interest in AI. And we're seeing this because of course it does promote efficiency, but now we have to think about fairness. And there's new considerations that have to come into account when you are including any kind of data analytics and especially if you're moving into AI and machine learning because the decision maker could actually become an algorithm, could become using machine learning. And at that point, if you don't create some sort of responsibility for fairness, how do we know that the outcome is fair? How do we know that we're providing a fair process? Since you mentioned courts and their use of ODR, now, uh, some people think that by using ODR, it will be possible to actually resolve the disputes without the involvement of courts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going back to the first question that I mentioned to you on the downsides of ODR. Do you think that ODR actually provides a way out of using courts, or do you think that the courts would still have a strong role to play in enforcing the awards or decisions rendered on the ODR platforms? So uh, the good news is that most of these mutually agreed outcomes through a court ODR process are really self-enforcing, meaning you end up with a contract and the parties abide by that contract. And so they may then never go back to court. So it is a way to um, actually help the courts with congestion. And in fact, if we look at ADR programs that are court connected and historically when they came up, you know, it wasn't just access to justice, of course, it was also efficiency. Um, and the hope that people would resolve their disputes on their own without really needing the courts. But your question brings up an additional issue that I do think is important to consider, which is this. If you have a court connected program, however, that feels not as consensual as it could be, that feels like it is a precursor, it's required, it's opt out and it's hard to opt out. Um, now you might need more court involvement in order to enforce an outcome. Because yes, any ODR program, I don't care what you're talking about, be it a private program or a court program, it's only as good as it is enforceable. So if individuals are not going to just voluntarily comply because they felt that it was a good process, I mean, that's what we hope for, right? That's the gold standard. The idea is if we create guardrails, if we create best practices, if we have a good formidable program, people are going to want to comply with it, and then you don't need to worry as much about enforcement. On the flip side, if you have a program that feels kind of forced, 
some repeat player advantages, different issues with data, different issues with consent, doesn't feel like it's providing you access to justice, everyone will be back in court. And so I do believe that being forward thinking and thinking about ways to guard fairness will actually help the efficiency. So in this wonderful way, you're promoting both efficiency and fairness by doing the right thing. So we thank Professor Schmitz for her presentation and thank Jay for the interview. Uh, we now proceed to the next uh, the panel on online hearings. This panel will be moderated by Mr. Jason Lee. Jay, you have the floor. Thank you, this is Jay. Uh, whoever did the uh, previous interview did it very well but that was me 10 days younger. So <laughs> it's a little bit awkward seeing myself doing the interview with a different person live. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, I am representing UNCITRA, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, uh, an intergovernmental body with a mandate to progressively harmonize and modernize international trade law. And I am the secretary of UNCITRA's working group two, which focuses on commercial arbitrations. Now it's a legislative body. So we are a norm making body developing and preparing international legal rooms. Uh, uh, ju I just wanted to go back a little bit because in, uh, those who just joined today might not have heard the background, but in 2020, the commission heard a proposal put forward by Japan uh, to conduct activities to collect and compile information about uh, latest trends and you know, developments in uh, international dispute resolution. And this July, the commission formally approved the project and asked the secretary to compile analyze and share relevant information. Uh, and in doing so, the commission emphasized the need for issues arising from digitization and its disruptive aspects, uh, in particularly related to due process and fairness, which Amy has just touched upon. And we're doing this with the support of the Ministry of Justice. And we thank the Ministry of Justice and Takashi actually for uh, holding this Tokyo Forum. Uh, yesterday, we had a very over, big overview of the different aspects of dispute resolution in the digital economy, uh, what to take stock of, you know, what are the technologies that's being used, what are the issues of too much information flooding in, how to ensure efficient case management, uh, developments in fintech disputes, uh, those with regard to access to and pres preservations of digital evidence. But when one talks about you know, dispute resolution in the digital economy, the one thing that everybody thinks about is actually online hearings. Uh, now, now I, I'm going to pose this to all of the speakers because we've used the word online hearings as the, theory, the topic of today. But if you look at the different terminology, we've also used video conferencing. Uh, we've also used remote hearings. We've also used hearings using technologies, hearings and platforms. So. Uh, I guess, uh, we're, uh, are we saying the same thing is a question that I'm going to be posing to the speakers who will be touching upon this topic of online hearings. Uh, I will not go into the bios of each of the speakers. Uh, we have uh, four eminent speakers that will be giving their thoughts on online hearings and what kind of new standards that UNCTRA may wish to develop on this topic. Uh, just to note that due to an urgent personal situation, one of the speakers, Kevin Nash, is not able to join today, and he has sent his sincere apologies. So I would like to ask the, the audience for his understanding on this. And as we do have a little bit more time, because he will not be presenting, if the audience has any comments or questions that they would like to pose to the speakers, please do so. Uh, use the chat functions or the Q&A function, and I'll be posing those questions to the respective speakers. Now, the first speaker that we have today is a, uh, he, she, off, she often comes to our own sexual meetings. Uh, it's Lisa Bingham, who will be talking about the legal basis for remote hearings and the ICA study on this topic. Uh, in the context of own and uh, just going back to the uh, presentations made by uh, the Director General of the Ministry of Justice, we are happy to have commented on the Japanese revisions of its arbitration law and we're hoping to see it uh, being revised based on the uh, UNCTRA model law, and we're happy to see that coming into news soon day. But one of the questions that we get about Article 24 of the UNCTRA model law on hearings is whether it requires a physical hearing. So uh, on this question, uh, uh, I think ICA has done a very comprehensive study on the different jurisdictions and how they understand hearings are to be conducted. 
So with that, I would like to give the floor to Lisa to start the question about the legal basis for hearings. Lisa, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jay. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers, the Japanese Ministry of Justice, Ansachal, and ICSID for the opportunity to speak to you today. Our first challenge is me sharing my screen. Let's see how we go. So I'm the Deputy Executive Director of ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. I'm also a legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, but I'm speaking to you today in my ICA capacity. ICA is an international non-governmental organisation founded in 1961 with the purpose of promoting the use and improving the processes of international arbitration and other forms of dispute resolution. ICA is chiefly known for its biennial congresses, its legal publications with CLUA arbitration, its judicial outreach work, and its role in opening the doors of international arbitration through Young ICA. Since around 2012, a growing part of ICA's work has been its research projects. Now, one of those projects, one of its most recent projects, asks the question, does a right to a physical hearing exist in international arbitration? And today I'm going to speak about how that project ties in with the questions that have been posed by the organisers of this forum, namely how to improve the quality of dispute resolution in the context of digitalization and what we should take stock of to achieve such improvement. Now, if you attended the previous iteration of this forum, which was in March this year, you will have heard Giacomo Rojas Elgueta, one of the co-editors of the ICA project, talk about its genesis and progress. When COVID lockdowns and restrictions on international travel began in early 2020, tribunals faced a choice. They could delay hearings until travel and gatherings were possible again, or they could hold hearings remotely. Now, recognising an urgent need for guidance in that situation, Giacomo and his colleagues, James Hosking and Yasmin Lalu, came up with the idea of a project to answer the question, does a right to a physical hearing exist in international arbitration? Now, that conceptual question about whether there is a right to a hearing can be restated more concretely in practice. Is there a risk that an award will be set aside or not enforced if the hearing has been held remotely instead of physically over the objection of one or both parties? The first stage of this project was the commissioning of national reporters to prepare responses to a list of survey questions by May 2021, 78 national reports had been published on ICA's website, and you can still access them there. Now that those reports have been published, the project's moved on to its second and final phase. The co-editors are currently finalising an overview essay, which will identify the key findings and trends in the national reports. Yesterday, ICA hosted a webinar for American, European and African time zones in which the key findings were presented, and tomorrow we'll host that webinar again, but in Middle East, Asian and Pacific time zones at 3 p.m. Tokyo time. The issues addressed by the ICA project are relevant to our stock taking questions in two main ways. The first is that the national reports and the overview essay that is still to come will provide a useful starting point in mapping the existing legal situation. That is, what is the nature and magnitude of the risk that an award may be set aside or not enforced because a remote hearing was ordered? Now, the first finding of the project was that the answer to that question, is there a right, is to be found in national law, or that is to say, in all the different national laws. There's no one transnational answer to the question. Obviously, a definitive answer to the question for each country will only be obtained when challenges to enforcement and applications to set aside have made their way through the national courts. That's going to take time, hence the reason for using national reporters to fill the gap in the meantime. According to the survey responses, there are three main responses. In some jurisdictions, a minority, there definitely is a right to a physical hearing. In some jurisdictions, there definitely isn't, and in some, the situation is uncertain. But in the majority of jurisdictions, 
there almost certainly isn't a right to a physical hearing. The decision to order a remote hearing is seen as falling within the procedural discretion of the arbitral tribunal or likely to fall within that discretion. The national reporters have said it's very likely that in the courts of those jurisdictions, an award following a remote hearing won't be at risk, provided that due process, that is the right to be heard and equal treatment, has been accorded to all parties. Now, unfortunately, there isn't time to go into detail about all the various different approaches that have been identified, but that will be covered in the ICA webinar tomorrow and also when the overview essay is made available on our website, probably in the next couple of weeks. There are two main points that I want to highlight, though, that are relevant to the discussion we're having today. The first was Jay referred to, I think, the model, the model law provision uh, pursuant to which a party can require an arbitral tribunal to hold an oral hearing. Now, national reports from some jurisdictions suggest that oral hearing means in-person or physical hearing, while reports from other model law jurisdictions considered that it would also include a remote hearing. Moving beyond the model law to questions of recognition and enforcement under the New York Convention, Again, there was some divergence as to the likely outcome where there was a right to a physical hearing in the place of arbitration, but a remote hearing was nonetheless ordered. If we look at Article 5.1b, which provides that recognition and enforcement can be refused where a party was otherwise unable to present his case, reporters for some jurisdictions said that the court where recognition and enforcement was sought would only look at its own due process standards, so the due process standards of the forum, while others said that the courts would decide the issue based on the procedural rules of the law of the seat. Then if we look at Article 5.1d, which provides that recognition and enforcement may be refused where the procedure was not in accordance with the law of the country where the arbitration took place, the courts are obviously then looking at the procedural laws of, this, of the seat in that situation, but the divergence comes up because in some jurisdictions, the fact that a remote hearing was ordered when a, a right to a physical hearing existed would be enough to refuse recognition and enforcement, whereas in other jurisdictions, an additional showing would be required, such as real prejudice to one of the parties. So in terms of stock taking, the 78 survey responses and the forthcoming overview essay will I think be useful in the process of mapping the jurisdictions in which there's potentially a barrier to making use of electronic hearing resources, whether that's due to the um, issues of interpretation of the model law or the New York Convention or for other reasons. And I think that's going to be useful in identifying the scope of the issue and then deciding whether new legislative instruments or amendments to existing instruments would be warranted. Now, the second way, I think, in which the issues raised by the right to a physical hearing project are relevant to the stop-taking questions starts with the finding I mentioned a few moments ago. In the majority of jurisdictions, a remote hearing ordered over the objection of one party doesn't put an eventual award at risk, provided that due process has been accorded. And that finding prompts another stop-taking question, which is what steps have been taken by courts and arbitrators since the start of the pandemic to ensure due process in a remote hearing context. The issues I've put up on the screen now are just examples of issues that might affect a party's ability to present its case and that could arise in both litigation and arbitration. I'm not suggesting these would necessarily rise to a level of putting an award at risk, but they are relevant to questions about improving the quality of dispute resolution. So we can look at internet upload and download speeds, which vary enormously worldwide. The stability of internet connection, reliability of electricity supply. We could think about the physical environment. If we think about the, the pandemic and the number of people participating in hearings from home, whether as witnesses or counsel, can they access IT support? Are there other people in the house or apartment that affect the ability of counsel witnesses and tribunal members to participate fully in a hearing. We can also think about the participation by people with disabilities. Remote hearings may involve greater or different challenges than physical hearings. 
Uh, to take one example, uh, consider a witness who may be partially deaf. They might be less able to lip read in a remote hearing situation, or they might find it very difficult to use the services of a remote interpreter where more than one language is being used. In terms of practical responses to those challenges, there's one example relating to IT that came up last week. In last week's Freshfields lecture entitled Gateways to Justice, the Centrality of Procedure in the Pursuit of Justice, uh, Chief Justice of Singapore, the Honourable Sundaresh Menon, gave an example of a decision taken in Singapore at the start of the pandemic to make rooms available on court premises from which parties could participate in remote hearings where they could use court-provided computers and have IT support while they wouldn't need to come into contact with other participants. There will be so many creative responses that have been employed in response to issues around the use of technology during the pandemic. I think there's probably a lot of data out there and arbitral institutions, law reform commissions and courts will be reporting on that if they haven't already. So I think that stock taking that data is going to be useful in the development of guidance for the conduct of arbitral proceedings. Now, before I finish, I'll just identify one way of prompting hearing participants to search for or think about practical responses uh, in, early enough in proceedings to do something about them would be through the use of checklists. Uh, in 2015, uh, one of ICA's first projects produced a checklist for the first procedural order. And I hope that in, during the course of 2022, we'll start working on an updated version, including things that are much more on people's minds now than they were in 2015. So cybersecurity, data protection, reasonable adjustments to facilitate the participation of people with disabilities, and more generally, issues specific to remote hearings. Um, by way of example of issues specific to remote hearings, that might include a reference to agreed technical specifications, such as those set out in the SOL protocol, which Kevin Kim will be discussing later in the session. So to summarise, two main ideas for stock taking. First, mapping the current legal landscape and risks to enforceability of awards. And second, stock taking the rich uh, data around practical responses to due process challenges that have been adopted by courts and arbitrators during the pandemic. Thank you all very much for your time and I'll hand back to Jay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I think this is going to be something that would we, we need to actually take into account as we take stock of the different developments because not only do we need to take stock of the technological developments, but we also need to take a look at the legal basis and how the case law has developed. But as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, is there a specific reason? I mean, I, get, I think I, this is a question that I would pose to everybody at the end, but Lisa, you had your study re refers to remote hearings and the antonym for that is the physical hearings, but I believe in it's a synonymous to online hearings, which we'll be talking about by other speakers. So I just wanted to seek your views on that after we've gone through other speakers. The next speaker was Kevin Nash, who was actually going to talk about services and technologies provided by arbitral institutions. Uh, I'll refer all of the audience to the IBA study that also has a list of different uh, technologies that are out there, you know, Skype, Zoom that we're using now. Uh, we had Blue Jeans, Cisco, uh, Loop, Loop Up. Uh, and there are also some uh, video conferencing utilities that are provided by arbitration, arbitration institutions. And we were hoping to have some inputs from uh, Kevin Nash on that, but I guess we'll have to skip that. And then we'll actually go straight to Kevin Kim. Uh, you'll be surprised that uh, he, he gave, I, the first lecture on arbitration I got on arbitration was from Kevin. So it's always an honor to have Kevin as a panelist on my panel. Uh, he will be speaking on the different aspects of the SOL video conferencing. Also, this is video conferencing uh, in, in light of online hearings. But I, I posed a number of questions to him, but I said uh, he said that he will be addressing them in his presentation. So I'll actually go straight to Kevin so that he can give his presentations. Uh, Kevin, you have the next 10 minutes. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for uh, kind invitation. Maybe I can share the uh, screen. Um, actually, that um, uh, it is quite um, this this uh, conference is quite timely because I'm I'm in the middle of uh, the virtual hearing. Uh, my hearing will start in an hour, 
So beauty of this virtual hearing is you still work during the day and you have a virtual hearing in the evening. Um, so I'm going to speak about um, um, a five different uh, topics uh, in connection with uh, the video, video conferencing protocol. Um, I, I'm going to focus on the, the SOAP protocol, actually. Uh, I will use that the, the basis of our discussion. SOAP protocol was introduced at, um, in November 2018, uh, ADR conference in Seoul, uh, which is co-organized by UNCITRAL. Uh, that is exactly one year before the COVID-19 appear. So at that time, uh, people are not that enthusiastic about the protocol of video conferencing. And uh, I remember that I, I was moderating the session from London, uh, the local time at in London at that time at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, I was moderating session by video. Um, and uh, that, but so protocols basically uh, try to provide the safeguard of uh, particularly focusing on witness examination because video conferencing uh, or, or the virtual hearing uh, is normally okay in the a party's arguments or tribunal's deliberation um, is subject to the security. Uh, but the, in case of witness examination, you have a lot of issues. So I, I to my, my presentation focusing on how we deal with that uh, a safeguard the cross-examination of witness uh, in, in the virtual hearing. Um, so the first point is integrity. Integrity, I, I just uh, show some photos of uh, the video uh, hearing I'm, 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 I've been conducting. Um, a, in, in, in a video, uh, you can see only a, a few person by video, but actually uh, yeah, a lot of people can uh, participate in the room. Um, so the how we um, safeguard the, the uh, video conferencing in avoiding any uh, issues of integrity, the first solution is uh, put the observer. So we, we send observer or just like we invite observer um, on the case. So normally observers are quite a junior lawyer or somebody is even not a lawyer who just uh, make sure that everything uh, is, is okay. But I'm, I'm wondering whether we can think about observers from institution or more neutral person or knowledgeable about the technology or requirement uh, for the video conferencing. So observer is one solution. And, and the other thing is that the, uh, you know, technology uh, supervision. So the, the, the person, anybody observer or somebody else have to make sure that the video cameras and um, the, the video camera settings and other things, because you, ha you can coach it uh, personally or you can coach it in a different way uh, using the using the other uh, equipment. So it's a, the monitoring, screen monitoring is one way. To, to see if he's not, he cannot in a position to send observers uh, to, to the hearing room uh, if the witnesses are uh, alone in the room. So we have some way to monitor cameras like uh, 180 degree camera, 380 cameras, or whatever camera you have, you still have problem. And have the exhibit is another issue. So because we share the exhibit uh, with a soft copy, then it, it, it uh, sometimes delay the process or the, uh, is a, um, the witness may not be comfortable to review the soft copy. So if it's more useful to have a hard copy. In, in case of hard copy, if it's sent in advance, the witness can see uh, the, the copies in advance. So we nowadays we are using um, the method that we just put the documents, hard copies in, in the envelope. That envelope will be opened just at the beginning of, of the cross-examination so that we have hard copies still have a good uh, security or integrity. So in case so protocol, we have the video conference uh, shall be shall be have sufficient quality, um, have the technical assurance as well. So technical assurance 
we have a lot of requirement or uh, and we can have a attachment of the what what the video how the video should be good how the audio should be good uh, video uh, is clear enough to show the expressions or the or the uh, the reactions of the witness is, uh, is is quite important, and then the the location of video is uh, is also important. And normally we have two v two cameras, and it just accommodate the both uh, the uh, witness face and the, uh, uh, the, the behavior. But I I want to emphasize equally the audio quality. So if you have bad audio quality, then video quality doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's very difficult to proceed uh, with this examination. So audio quality is also uh, equally important. And the uh, individuals have a good connection. So um, I see many occasions that we are disconnected in the course of arbitration. Uh, very famous arbitrator, you know, uh, quite, quite developed countries that we have the same, same problem in, 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 the, uh, in the connection because we, we actually exchange a lot of documents, data in the course, of the, uh, the course of the hearing. So you just make sure that we have a dedicated line or uh, sufficient data uh, space in, 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 the, in the technology. So one example I will show that uh, this is one of the, uh, our, our uh, facility, we use that the witness, we use separate room for the witness examination. Um, and uh, we have a camera on the uh, in front to see the witness face. And we have different camera and di different uh, computers to show the uh, transcript and then show the whole uh, the, uh, the room to, to make sure that there is no, no, no issue of integrity. And and uh, the, this uh, uh, the speakers also be arranged to make sure that we have a very good quality transmission of audio. And then uh, the transcript is also uh, sometimes cause the issue. So we have a uh, we have some dis disconnection of transcript flow that is sometimes it just uh, uh, block the uh, uh, you know, arbitration process. And so we should always have the emergency plan. So we have separate. Uh, method to communicate or the uh, have of the recording different way of recording uh, just just for the uh, emergency uh, situation okay next issue is venue so so protocol article 2 shows that, that to the extent possible the place should be the neutral and then the that that the that, that place should be the right place to to uh, for the video conferencing so what I actually propose is that video conferencing venue can be also provided by institution or certified by institution. So it's kind of certified uh, venue. Um, yes, what could be a law firm's office or the institution's office or any, any facility who had good connections, good experience and tech, uh, in those technology requirements and the issue of integrity um, and provide uh, the neutral and very safe connection to the video conferencing. Um, I, I think it's a very important um, a, 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 in the video conferencing. So the, in, in case of venue, uh, we, have, we, we propose actually the certified venue uh, by, by UNCITRAL, by um, a, uh, uh, other arbitration institutions. So we have, a, um, for example, if the place of uh, arbitration is Tokyo, and we have a, a witness from Singapore, uh, Paris, or, or, or the law firm from, from Seoul, and they, if these places are certified venue, then, then you, have, you don't have to worry about the, the connections or integrity or, or the technical requirement, uh, because the place will guarantee uh, the quality or, or, or integrity of, uh, of the video conferencing. Uh, the other minor issue uh, is it's not really minor in, in, in the practical terms with interpretation. So interpretation in the video conferencing, you have different channel um, and you see you can use the simultaneous translation. It's quite tempting to use the simultaneous translation, but my experience that simultaneous translation is quite challenging to everybody and difficult to check the accuracy of the, um, the interpretation. So a, a protocol just proposed that we prefer that just, um, 
a consecutive trans interpretation, but depending upon the technology and the, uh, uh, the situation, you can use the simultaneous translation. Um, so I just uh, show that the, because sometimes a very hot, very hot, the heated discussion about the, how we accommodate the translation, but just make sure that always, always you should have a good recording of both original language and, and English, a language of arbitration, uh, so that if any issues in connection with uh, interpretation. Um, and, and the hearing arrangement is the uh, Article 9 just say to the possible party should make, sh make request tribunal to use video conferencing at the hearing at this is 72 hours before the commencing hours. So it's like a, uh, we, have, we have in advance uh, a requirement and just the test and the, also make, uh, make sure that the proper arrangement, but all these can be possible when you have a certified or um, a venues or uh, a, a assistance from the institution or some organization like UNCITRA. Um, the last thing I want to just emphasize is, is the here a time zone issue. I, I recently have a hearing starting from uh, eight, eight o'clock, eight p.m. in the evening and finished the hearing at four a.m. in the morning for two weeks. Um, I, I, I survived, but this, uh, uh, I think we can think about the human right issue of witness and counsel, and actually the issue of the right to be heard. The right to be heard can be covered, of course, you know, virtual hearing can accommodate right to be heard if somebody cannot appear in person. But if you ever have an illustration to testify at, after midnight, uh, we have issue whether or not that the, the right to be heard is properly uh, a, a, a secured uh, in, in the video conferencing. So uh, that is the big challenge. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for the video conferencing so that uh, I don't have a particular <laughs> solution, but we should think about the proper rest time and the uh, remedy time um, um, a, for, for the video conferencing. So those should, should be uh, all properly considered. Uh, that's all I have now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I just have one question just right, right after this, your presentations. Does the SO protocol address the consequences of when one party does not agree to video conferencing? Uh, does, does, is there a rule on what to do if one of the parties says they don't want to do video conferencing? Do you have a rule on that? Uh, no, not, not actually. So so, uh, so protocol basically uh, covers just focusing on the, what arrangement could be made. So at that time, we did not think about the right for the virtual hearing, so was with the so protocol did not uh, contain such a, such a portion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we'll be actually delving de deeper into these questions because Yoshihiro uh, will be presenting the JIDSD study on the same aspect. I, I tried to stop uh, sharing, but you have stopped sharing, so we don't see your screen anymore. So from us, it's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. So, okay, I will we'll go straight to Yoshiro to, uh, on the online hearings and the GIDRC study. You have to follow Yoshiro. Thank you very much, Jay. And it's quite an honor to uh, uh, be, make a presentation here, and especially after, you know, my respectful uh, Kevin Kim. So uh, first uh, thing, the, the, I'm uh, presenting the online hearing witness examination and GIDRC study. Although uh, JIDRC is the facility, it's not that uh, arbitration institution. So we do not have a fixed uh, protocol or something, but we have a, a sample uh, to be cooked by the uh, uh, parties and arbitrators, uh, which I explain later. And uh, my capacity is the, I'm the uh, uh, chair of the uh, web hearing study committee and advisory board of the uh, JIDRC. And uh, also, uh, just recently, I'm done uh, as the mediator for the uh, full virtual joint protocol, uh, combining with the with the uh, JIMC Kyoto and uh, ISI MC uh, as a part of the uh, app med app of the SIC and SIMC. So um, uh, ma mainly today, I'm speaking about the uh, for the arbitration aspects. Uh, the three aspects. The first one is the 
hard aspects, the technology aspect. And second aspect is the uh, soft law, uh, due process issues. And then third, uh, how to uh, proceed with the uh, countermeasures, uh, including how to avoid the uh, uh, witness coaching, something which <coughs> uh, Kevin also uh, touched. Uh, so the main issue is uh, what should be done to improve the quality of the dispute resolution in the context of the uh, digitalization, bearing in mind the principle of the dispute resolution, including due process and the fairness. And specifically, uh, what should we take stock of uh, uh, to be achieve that project uh, objective? So uh, I'm stepping into the uh, uh, the second uh, soft law and due process uh, key issue, uh, practical recent issues of the uh, online hearing witness examination uh, based upon the the recent experience and uh, are utilizing the JDLC. Uh, so especially the uh, witness coaching inappropriate interference by the third party, how to avoid. Then just the example of the coaching method is uh, uh, just three samples, typical ones. First one is the witness can read, see materials, memos, other devices outside the scope of a computer display, uh, which tribunal can observe and then uh, testify referring to those materials. That's first uh, sample. And someone such as the councils or person directed by the councils is present present outside the scope of the computer display, uh, which tribunal can observe, and such person do coaching by showing good sign or bad sign something. And then third, uh, witness wears uh, headphones, and the one of which is the connected with the coaching person. You know, you have a, the human beings has the two uh, ears, so one ear can be a coach, something like that. Uh, so those issues and the how to avoid coaching. Uh, the uh, agreement on the uh, protocol, uh, which is uh, just a, a sample, uh, can be cooked uh, by the uh, parties, but among the uh, parties, and then tribunal on cre concrete countermeasures, including number of cameras located in the room where the uh, witness testifies, and operative function of the camera, such as the uh, 30, uh, 360 degrees circulation, uh, as the uh, Kevin mentioned, the, you know, sometimes 90 degrees or 180 degrees can be sufficient, but uh, uh, some parties prefer 36, uh, 30, 360 degrees and circulation to observe an arrangement of a witness uh, and arrangement of the uh, witness, supervisor, checker, observer, uh, whatever can be called as the, again, uh, I heard uh, from the Kevin mentioned the observer type of uh, uh, witness supervisor. Uh, can be arranged. That's also uh, under current uh, discussion. <clears throat> uh, so the regarding the uh, uh, camera's location and the function, uh, according to my experience, one, one example is like uh, three cameras should be located in the uh, uh, witness room. Like first one, of course, you should have a face, witness's face uh, you can catch. And then second camera should catch entire room you know, anyone, any strangers are uh, not there. And third, uh, that's also very important, is the uh, uh, computer display or whatever uh, eye directions target of the witness. I mean, the if witness can see the computer display, then whether the computer display uh, will not showing any coaching or any information or material or something. So those kind of... Uh, uh, arrangement had been uh, uh, done actually uh, utilizing the uh, uh, JIDRC's <coughs> proceeding and need should arrange depending upon the uh, uh, case and the uh, party's preference and the convenience. And while some arbitrators say, think that if you observe the witness's eye direction, you can figure out such coaching. And uh, but uh, others, including myself, like may, may point out that it may be impossible for all cases. So we, we should have a kind of a Superman type of arbitrator to figure out. So how to avoid, how to arrange is quite still key for the uh, keeping the due process and how to keep efficiency or visibility of the objections. That's also quite important to during the witness examination. So adjusting computer display, uh, voice connection volume, as uh, Kevin mentioned, the you know audio is very very important. And then tribunals shall make it sure to catch objections to be raised by councils. 
And in order to avoid the situation where the tribunal do not catch objections and let the uh, testimony continue, uh, such concern or possibility should be shared by tribunal deeply. And then the parties who can utilize function of the uh, video link platform or emailing, which can react on such a uh, situation. So uh, the how to proceed with the tribunal's deliberation, discussion, and internal discussion among the uh, parties and council. That's really uh, important, uh, not only for the arbitration, but the mediation as well. But uh, uh, utilizing the efficiently the breakout room function uh, can be utilized. And second, tribunal for internal discussion and parties, councils for internal discussion should set up a separate web conference because uh, break, breakout room uh, may cause risk uh, that the inappropriate person may enter by incorrect operation and the participants may not aware of it. So that kind of a, a countermeasure could be figured out. And actually the such a breakout room function was very efficiently utilized for the uh, joint protocol case uh, with the, between the uh, uh, JIMC and uh, ISMC actually, according to my experience, very, very efficient. And then uh, parties and tribunal agreement or protocol to react against possible issues involved in web hearing and how to take care of the procedural order, something like that, and should be discussed more and deeply. And if clear and binding rules are provided or agreed, a violation of such rules might trigger challenge against arbitration award, something like that. So too much details uh, rules might be um, useful, but might be some challenging for the uh, basis for the future this uh, risk. And one idea is the implementation of the uh, online site check or witness supervisor. Although the uh, nature of such witness supervisor is also uh, under discussion, like he is uh, under direction of the tribunal for just a uh, uh, you know, directed or, or dispatched by the institution, as Kevin mentioned. So those, depending on the nature, uh, we should figure out how uh, to deal with the uh, uh, situation where, like, for example, such witness uh, supervisor point out some mistake or some happenings or occurrence by the parties. or So how to deal with it is uh, deeply uh, related to those nature of the legal nature of the uh, such uh, witness observer as well. <clears throat> so uh, then background reasons for virtual uh, online proceeding, that's uh, just uh, COVID-19, but even after or post COVID-19 would be uh, quite uh, <clears throat> under discussion. And then facility technology connection side. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, JIDRC's uh, web page, so you, you can uh, <clears throat> refer to that. And then two facilities we have in Tokyo and Osaka. So uh, those uh, six uh, breakout rooms or something, that's just uh, information. And the equipment uh, suited to the uh, uh, virtual hearing, uh, both for the JIDRC and uh, Osaka, and the video conference system, as uh, indicated here. And then uh, those just, uh, it's kind of a promotion of the JIDRC's uh, facilities and equipment that uh, I put it just as those information. Then. Wi-Fi service, of course, that's very important. And then uh, real-time script preparation service. Uh, uh, that's really important. At the uh, JDRC Tokyo, this script may be prepared uh, real-time by the uh, live script equipment, voice to text for automatic transcript software using AI uh, is a plan to be implemented and development. Uh, while the quality of the uh, Japanese language uh, should have some issues uh, compared by the English, but even for the English, you know, uh, for example, my you know non-native English were not uh, perfectly caught by the AIs uh, or such uh, you know, uh, transcript. So such you know maybe I, I really uh, ruined that I, my English should be uh, brushed up more <laughs> through such experience actually. So uh, then those uh, photographs or JDRCs. Um, equipment and uh, simultaneous interpretation service we have. But I, I completely agree with the uh, Kevin, Kim. The, uh, uh, the, the, the simultaneous translation, I strongly uh, prefer the uh, consecutive uh, uh, translation because two, two aspects, two reasons. First one is the uh, preciseness 
you know, to, to, to be uh, really, that's very important. And then also second supplemental reason is to, to have a sort of a, you know, enough allowance for the timing of the objections or <laughs> such time allowance or allowance would be practically quite important. So that's uh, uh, <coughs> the, the JID receives uh, showing. And then discussion evaluation by web hearing study group and proposal. That's, I, I was a chairing of uh, a such group, study group, and then evaluation of uh, current facility and the equipment uh, technology and the facility. The hardware aspect. So JIDRC is uh, sufficiently equipped with their facilities for our partial uh, virtual hearing, and uh, uh, also some improvement for their checking the situation, environment of the witness, whether they are uh, not coached at the hearing room, uh, even by a remote tribunals. It is so th as I mentioned, the our so-called witness supervisor or on-site checker or observer uh, is uh, under discussion, and then currently discussion on whether we JIDRC should uh, provide or not. And then facilitating collaboration with the uh, HKIC, SIC, and not only for international arbitration, arbitration, but also for mediation, for which JMC Kyoto is collaborating in terms of uh, facility equipment and operation, so that the uh, convenience and the efficiency for ADR users can be um, <coughs> satisfied. And uh, soft rule, uh, the guideline aspect the, in accordance with the uh, uh, arbitration act law and uh, soft law and uh, uh, rules. That's quite important. And uh, due process and key factors is opportunity to assert or defend, uh, especially for due process aspect. That's the kind of a key element. And then equality issue and the confidentiality issue. And actually, I, I was uh, presenting uh, in uh, Paris for the uh, at the World Bank on the uh, cyber security for international arbitration and the mediation, actually, but it's really, really getting uh, important, especially for this uh, kind of online witness examination and uh, online hearing. Uh, that's my final word. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Uh, I promised Emmanuel, uh, I promised James that I'll make sure that I finish on time. So we'll go straight to our next speaker, uh, Emmanuel Ta will be talking about the conduct of hearings on online platforms. So we've been talking about uh, hearings on the traditional arbitration mechanisms where hearings are conducted online, but let's see how the hearings are going to be conducted on an online dispute resolution pl uh, platforms. Uh, Emmanuel, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Just... Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you well. Okay, great. So today I'm going to talk about the conduct of hearings on online platforms, focusing on the technical aspects and safeguards in place. And to do so, I will share with you how online hearings are conducted on Ibram's ODR platform. Ibram International Online Dispute Resolution Center was established in 2018 to provide a one-stop shop for commercial parties from all over the world with a deal-making and dispute resolution online platform, integrating the latest technology. Ibram is an ODR provider and institution and launched various sets of rules, including the COVID-19 ODR, the APEC ODR, e-mediation and e-arbitration rules. Ibram launched its first ODR platform in June 2020 and is currently developing an ODR platform for resolving cross-border business-to-business disputes within the APEC economies, as well as a standalone e-mediation and e-arbitration platform for next year. In terms of law tech services, Ibram developed its own video conferencing system and e-signing system, which have been integrated into our ODR platform. Our ODR platform is a technology-based platform with a human element for the administration of cases and the decision-making. The platform is multilingual and includes various functions. And I'm not going to mention them all here, but only focus on the communication tools. So the platform has an inbuilt communication box for the exchange of communications and case submissions and an inbuilt video conferencing system. In terms of the technical aspects, our video conferencing system includes functions such as a public and private chat, breakout rooms, file and screen sharing, note sharing and editing, 
a record function, a recording function is also available on the platform. Now, the breakout room function can also be used for online mediation on an ODR platform. Separate caucus sessions can be held where each party and the council can meet privately or with the mediator in their own breakout room. Tribunals and parties can communicate by video conference anytime throughout the proceedings using the video conferencing system available on the ODR platform. And on this point, IBRAM arbitration rules provide that in the event of an online hearing on the IBRAM platform, the arbitral tribunal shall give the parties adequate advance notice of the date, time, and means of attendance here thereof. So once a hearing date has been agreed and fixed on the ODR platform, the system will create a hearing room and generate a link available on the platform for all parties to join the hearing. And our system will soon integrate new features, including e-bundling, e-transcription, and e-translation services. And in terms of the conduct of hearings on our ODR platform, Ibrahim arbitration rules provide that if any party so requests, the arbitral tribunal shall hold online hearings on the Ibrahim platform for the presentation of evidence by witnesses. In practice, hearings can be conducted either fully remotely on, or in a hybrid format. If, for instance, both parties and their respective council are in the same location. For hybrid hearings, Ibram can also provide facilities in Hong Kong with no, with no additional room charge. Like remote hearings taking place in traditional arbitration process, conducting hearings through an ODR platform also requires tribunals and parties to consult and issue protocols for the organization of their online hearings, addressing among others logistics, confidentiality, participants, and examination of witnesses. Ibram's arbitration rules provide in this regard that hearings shall be confidential unless the parties agree otherwise. The rules also say that witnesses, including expert witnesses, may be heard under the conditions and examined in the manner set by the arbitral tribunal. So for the cross-examination of witnesses, parties and tribunals are to discuss on the appropriate measures to ensure the integrity of um, the witness room. During the hearing, Ibram will provide a dedicated hearing manager and offer electronic presentation of evidence services. Now turning to the safeguards for hearings on ODR platforms. I would like to start by looking at the anti technical notes on ODR adopted in 2016. The notes take the form of a descriptive and non-binding document reflecting elements of an ODR process. And the United Nations General Assembly recognize that ODR can assist the parties in resolving disputes in a simple, fast, flexible, and secure manner without the need for physical presence at a meeting or hearing, and recommended all member states to use the technical notes in designing and implementing ODR system. The technical notes refer to communications between the parties and the neutral through the platform during each stage of the proceeding, i.e. negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. They also provide that during the arbitration stage, the neutral should be allowed to conduct the ODR proceedings in such a manner as he or she considers appropriate. But the technical notes do not mention online meetings or hearings or provide any guidance as to how these hearings should be conducted on the ODR platform. Having said that, the last part of the technical notes does recognize the need for guidelines in relation to the conduct of ODR platforms and administrators. In the same way, we need guidelines and recommendations for the conduct of hearings on ODR platforms. The technical notes further provide some guidance as to what standards should be applied to platforms and state that ODR processes should be subject to the same confidentiality and due process standards that apply to dispute resolution proceedings in an offline context. So ODR providers are to develop platforms which comply with these standards. So to ensure confidentiality of hearings of, on our ODR platform, various safeguards have been put in place. Any hearing on our video conferencing system is protected by a password. A dedicated hearing manager will monitor the hearing and verify the identity of all participants before letting them enter the hearing room. As the video conferencing system is part of our ODR platform, any dedicated hearing manager will be coming from our institution. 
and before the commencement of the hearing, parties and tribunals will be requested to provide a list of all participants, identifying any lead speakers or indicating whether witnesses are allowed to attend the whole session or only part of the hearing. Our platform also includes an authentication system using the EKYC Know Your Customer technology to verify the identity of witnesses or experts who join the hearing. If such verification is necessary and requested by the tribunal. All data and hearings are encrypted using blockchain technology to ensure file and hearing integrity. To ensure fairness on, of the online hearing, our team will verify that our video conferencing system is accessible by all participants. Test sessions will be conducted by our team as well to ensure that all participants are familiar with the system and equipment. During the proceedings, the hearing manager will monitor the system and take all necessary steps if and when a technical problem arises. So if a party is disconnected during the hearing, our team will let the tribunal know and provide assistance to the party to rejoin the session. In terms of cybersecurity, our platform is protected by the highest level cloud of security, including firewalls, intrusion detection, and the 24-7 network, network threat monitoring. Our network also complies with international cybersecurity standards. Audits, including privacy impact assessment, are conducted by external certified security consultants on an annual basis. So to conclude, technologies such as ODR platforms are available tools that ODR providers have developed and can be used to improve the quality and efficiency of this resolution. ODR systems are based on the fact that the parties can mix and match and use different mechanisms to resolve their disputes through negotiation, mediation, and arbitration quickly and cost-effectively. They are accessible from any part of the world on computer, tablet, or mobile phone, and facilitate access to, access to justice. New technologies, including AI and blockchain, are changing the dispute resolution landscape. AI can create significant time and cost savings, and as a provider of law tech tools, Iran will soon integrate into its video conferencing system, e-transcription and e-translation services, which will be available to the parties during the online hearing. And this will enhance the quality of this resolution by reducing further the cost of the arbitral proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, we are about two minutes over time, but I think I just wanted to thank all the speakers who spoke on the online hearings and also hearings on online platforms. I think uh, as the stock taking continues, we have to see whether we need to develop an express role on the conduct of online hearings, uh, whether we need to reinforce the discretions of the tribunals to conduct online hearings, whether it's a rule or whether it's some sort of a guidance or protocols. We also may need to develop roles on safeguarding uh, fairness. I think that's also something we need to take stock of. Uh, on the different technologies and services, I'm a bit uh, uncertain whether a harmonized approach is the best approach. We might actually have it leave it to the market so that uh, different technologies is developed. Uh, this is actually uh, a principle that is embodied in the ancestral text and technological neutrality. So we may actually leave it to the a market to see how the technology will develop. Uh, and we mentioned a lot of the technological requirements on confidentiality, cybersecurity, on translation and interpretations, which all needs to be taken into account as we actually do take stock of and possibly develop any new standards in this area. So with that, uh, I have just gone three minutes over time. James, I'm a little bit sorry, but if there are not any urging uh, interventions from our speakers, I would like to pass over the floor to James so that he can, I think we'll be able continue discussions on, uh, it's not on, we have not talked about online arbitration, but the next panel will be talking about online mediation. James? Well, thank you very much, Jay, for the excellent timekeeping. Let me begin by congratulating ICSID, UNSATRAL, and the Ministry of Justice of Japan for organizing this excellent forum and for making a place for mediation and discussions about the digital future. Uh, I'm also grateful to you for inviting me to participate as mediator. My name is James Claxton. I'm an ADR uh, practitioner and also a professor of law at Waseda University in Tokyo. Digital ev evangelists have told us for more than a decade that the future of ADR is online. 
the COVID-19 pandemic has propelled us into the future that they imagined. Mediators and parties with no online experience have been driven, sometimes reluctantly, uh, into the virtual world. This shift reveals the comparative advantages of online mediation, but it has also raised some systemic concerns. How can mediators build trust with parties at a distance? How can procedural fairness be safeguarded online? Is there a need for online mediation standards and codes of conduct? What role can institutions play in support of online mediation? Here to discuss these questions and take stock of online mediation more generally is a truly remarkable panel of mediation experts. Let me introduce each of them briefly. Professor Nadja Alexander specializes in cross-cultural disputes involving corporations and communities. She sits on the Advi International Advisory Board of the United Nations Global Mediation Panel and is director of the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy at the Singapore Management University where she is a professor. Described as a practical thinker and a thinking practitioner, Nadja is internationally recognized for her deep knowledge of mediation and her inclusive communication style. Anne Karen Grill serves as counsel, arbitrator, and mediator in multi-jurisdictional commercial disputes. She is a CEDAR accredited medi mediator and an IMI certified mediated advocate, as well as a member of the ICC Court of Arbitration a member of the board of the Austrian Arbitration Association and a member of the Mediation Advisory Board of the Vienna International Arbitration Center. On nomination of the Republic of Austria and Karen was appointed to the panel of conciliators of ICSID. Chan Wei Ming is CEO of the Singapore International Mediation Center. He has more than 30 years of experience working from Beijing, Hong Kong, Sydney, and Singapore. Prior to joining the SIMC, he served as general counsel of IBM Greater China and Nortel Networks Asia Pacific for about 20 years. Weiming graduated with a law degree from the National University of Singapore and holds a Master of Laws from the University of Hong Kong. He is called to the Singapore Bar and the Hong Kong's role of solicitors. William Wood QC is a leading international mediator based in London. He was the 2018 Mediation Lawyer of the Year and is the ADR representative on the Civil Justice Council of England and Wales. Bill was educated at Oxford and Harvard before going to the London Bar in 1980. He became a QC in 1998 and spent over 25 years as a commercial litigator. Bill began to mediate in 1999 and now practices full-time commercial mediation, handling some 80 cases each year involving many overseas jurisdictions. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, we will take about 40 minutes for a uh, discussion and try and leave some time at the end for audience questions. With that, I would like to invite the audience uh, to uh, insert your questions in the Q&A function, or you can use the chat function. So uh, let's start at perhaps the most natural place to start, which is the beginning of an online mediation. Perhaps I could turn to uh, Nadja. How do you prepare yourself and parties for an online mediation? And what kind of advice and materials do you give to the parties? Hi, James. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much to the organisers. I'm thrilled to be here. So um, in terms of uh, the pre-mediation preparation, I think it's always important, and I remind myself, that online mediation is more than just emulating a face-to-face -face mediation, whether you're using a social communication platform like Zoom or a dedicated ODR platform. And also that online mediation can mean very, very different things to different people. So for the preparation, I have three guiding themes, and then I have a couple of points that I, I follow, and I'll, I'll go through those in the, in the next few minutes. 
So my guide, guiding themes are these, you know, to what extent is the, I guess, the forum or the platform I'm going to use user-centred? And by that I mean, you know, how can I ensure that there is party autonomy, that there is still flexibility and not just a, a rigid online procedure, for example? How can I ensure that party interests are maximised? Right, that's user-centredness. Then I'm checking about, I'm checking reliability. Reliability in terms of technology, yes, but also reliability in terms of confidentiality, right, in the platform, uh, security. And we heard Emmanuel Attar just talk about some of those factors in the context of Ebram. Um, but also reliability in terms of the applicable law, that there's a connect between the online platform or system that I'm using and the applicable law, and that that's been specified and there's some, you know, a, a common understanding and some clarity around that. Um, and, and, and not just the applicable law to the process, but also to any mediated outcome coming out of this procedure, which may be signed and documented online as well. So is it robust and reliable in those, in those ways? And the third theme for me is accessibility. And of course, in the online world, we're not so much talking about geographical accessibility, but are the participants sufficiently digitally, digitally literate and do they also have the optimal devices to access the mediation? And this may seem like a, you know, a sort of a, a trite matter, but for example, while you can usually always access online mediation with a smartphone, there's a different, you know, you see and read and have access to different things if you're using a smartphone compared to if you're in a, uh, you know, a, a, a mediation physical venue with a computer and a big screen. And that can uh, affect your... Uh, accessibility and ability to participate um, well in a mediation. So I'll be thinking of those themes as I'm, you know, as I'm preparing. And in terms of sort of the main thing points that I go through, a lot of it's got to do with process design, because I'll go back to one of my first statements, online mediation is not online mediation is not online mediation, right? It's, it's, it can be so different. So depending on the dynamics and the context and the parties, I'll be thinking about, hmm, is it, are we going to do text-based or video or both? I heard someone talking about 360-degree cameras, right? Are they available for all of the participants or only some of them? Are we looking at a synchronous online forum or an asynchronous or both? What about records, document management, signing off on the mediated settlement agreement? What about the agreement to mediate? So I'll be thinking through how to design all those elements and mostly consulting with the parties and their lawyers on that. And of course, there might be the online case filing management um, uh, uh, as well um, that, that's available. And I think, um, you know, for me at least, it's important to think about, do I use a dedicated online platform or do I use something that's more generally familiar and available like Zoom or like Teams um, with waiting rooms and breakout rooms? And I think there are pros and cons to each. Uh, but I also think it's something to be thought through and decided each time rather than, you know, going to default. Technical support, what's your plan, plan B if something doesn't work? So that's sort of the first big chunk. In terms of process design still, I'm thinking about what can I do better online that, than I can do face-to-face -face, or what can mediation do better online? So, for example, it may be that we can have much better or easier or efficient access to documents, documents at our fingertips. Why? Because we're not relying on participants to bring them, but they are, you know, sent in, scanned ahead of time, for example. Um, and, uh, and we might be looking at the documents through, you know, through a, a, a single screen. So is there faster access to resource material? I might be thinking, will it be advantageous for me to do simultaneous caucusing? with parties rather than caucusing with one party and then another party, right? That can be a controversial point as well. But again, I'll be thinking through, are there some things that I can do better and differently online? And of course, you know, people can zone in and zone out and some people in the audience are probably zoning out right now. Um, and so instead of, you know, a typical single session, I'll be factoring a lot more breaks um, and I'll also often, not always, but often default to, um, or default's the wrong word, often shift to uh, mul a multiple meeting setting where we might have, you know, a couple of hours 
each day or over several days in one week, right? Because it can suit different time zones, it can suit people, uh, and and their um, you know their their focus is better that way. So more bite sized chunks, which is something that you can't necessarily do if people have um, flown in from a long distance um, and are here for a fixed amount of time. And then I'll talk in my pre-mediation meetings and I actually spend a lot more time when I'm doing online work in the pre-mediation part than I you would do in a face-to-face -face part. Um, and this is just, you know, the way I would work or, um, is that I'll talk through where the participants are joining from in terms of time zone, location, physical venue, whether the clients and the lawyers are physically together or not, because that's, you know, that might have an impact on whether I need to factor in time for lawyer client consultation. Um, and what are the implications of where they are for, for privacy, for possible interruptions, for checking authenticity, those sorts of issues? What devices are they using? The accessibility point um, uh, that I mentioned above. I think very often, you know, online mediation is not purely online. It's often hybrid. So if it's feasible, um, I think a hybrid process, some offline and some online, is uh, can be great because it gives you the ability to get the best of both worlds. And by that I mean, um, for me, I find it easier to develop trust um, and empathy in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, and uh, and that's probably also why I spend more time doing a in, in the pre-mediation phase, amongst other things for that reason. Um, but a hybrid process will also give you the efficiencies and cost savings of, uh, of online. So there's a lot more time talking through the process, I think. Um, I usually provide our, um, participants with a, a type of digital readiness uh, checklist, um, regardless of how tech savvy, savvy they, you know, they say they are. Um, and that will, you know, that will cover uh, items like equipment and software and settings and troubleshooting some of the various, you know, topics I've 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 um, dealt with before. I, um, and I recall vividly just, you know, just talking about digital literacy. And we often assume that, you know, everyone has, you know, sufficient digital literacy. But I remember a, a, a mediation which was originally a face-to-face -face mediation, and it became, for various reasons, um, an online mediation after a particular period of time. It flicked online, and it was a multi-generational commercial dispute. Um, and what was really fascinating to me was that all of a sudden, I mean, you'd seen the, I'll say, the elders in, in this multi-generational uh, dispute, uh, you know, taking the floor most of the time. But when we switched to online, you saw many participants from the younger generation stepping up um, because they were more familiar with the technology and participating in a, you know, in, in a different way. I think um, personally, I tend to prepare my script a little more. Um, I generally have my points in an e-document. I put them just below the camera um, so that I'm so, so that because I've got a lot of other things going on. Um, so if I sort of find myself getting scrambled, I'm right, I'm right there. And I think that, you know, the final thing that I'd like to mention just now um, in this uh, sort of initial piece is, is that um, sometimes the mediation agreement, the agreement to enter mediation, and also the ground rules might need to be tweaked. Um, you know, for example, if you're if everyone's online, well, they're sort of they're getting messaging, they're getting emails, will that need to be switched off? How do we handle interruptions if they're you know at home or at the workplace? Um, what sort of commitments uh, you know do we need to make in addition to the you know? Um, uh, uh, well, let me rewind. What sort of commitments do we need to make about privacy and authenticity recording and other matters? So I think you know in many ways, yes, we can get on Zoom and do it, but I think. For me, the, so the preparation becomes a very different piece or much more nuanced piece um, than in a face-to-face -face setting. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for providing that very helpful overview of preparation. We'd now like to turn to the mediation process itself. And for this, I'll look to, to Bill. Bill, what are the advantages and the limits of online mediation? And what would you consider to be good practices for mediators online? James, thank you. Um, uh, it's a great honor, let me just say, to um, 
be addressing the the forum here. Um, been, it's been extremely interesting, and um, I'm learning a lot. Um, let me let me give you some perspectives from from London and from uh, the last eighteen months. Um, in March 2020, I had never mediated online. Uh, I'd seen individuals appear on video link in some arbitrations. I'd seen you know, isolated examples of video links being used in mediations. Uh, sound and tech were pretty dodgy. It was frequently it seemed a very inferior kind of process. So that it was with some apprehension that we suddenly approached the need to use these techniques uh, pretty solidly. Uh, I'd uh, I just bought a reasonably good external camera, which was a stroke of luck because uh, shortly after March 2020, it became impossible to buy any of the technology, certainly in England, uh, that you might need to use. Um, what I didn't know was that of the 114 mediations I've done since March 2020, 105 of them would be using that camera. So it was a pretty sudden uh, baptism. Um, I am, for the time being, returning to some face-to-face -face mediation in London now. I mean, I've even been abroad to mediate, I went to Abu Dhabi to mediate. It's a sort of slow reintroduction. But even now, roughly 50% of my practice is on, is on Zoom. And, um, well, who knows what the future will bring from a number of points of view. Mediation has thrived. It's been successful. It's worked. Uh, I, we aren't breaking any really new ground technologically. There's no AI. There's no blockchain in what we're doing. We are simply finding that we can replicate the sequences and the meetings of an ordinary face-to-face -face mediation using almost entirely Zoom, I have to say. Some people use blue jeans, uh, uh, but, um, but it's, it tends to, be, tends to be Zoom. And as I say, who knows what the future will bring. Um, advantages... I've written down three concepts under advantages, convenience, which is kind of obvious, collaboration, which may not be so obvious, and um, accessibility. And then under limitations, I've written lack of accessibility, engagement, and energy. Uh, so those, I've got sort of three topics under, under each heading, and I'll work through those. Uh, convenience. Remote mediation not only solves the problem of the risk of infection, but it brings huge advantages in convenience, stating the absolutely obvious parties in different continents can mediate and negotiate minimal additional cost and inconvenience. Mediations can be arranged very short notice, no flights, no trains, no hotels. And as I think Nadja was hinting a moment ago, one thing that has become much easier is to have a proper pre-mediation contact with your, not just the lawyers involved in the case, which has traditionally always been the case, but the parties so on the mediation day, I will have had, usually now, quite significant contact in Zoom calls privately with each side's decision makers. Uh, and that has, been, that has been revolutionary. And if there's a single gain from the Zoom period, it is, it is that. Collaboration. At least at the start, it may be wearing off now, but at least at the start, there was a sense of adventure and collaboration about parties coming to an online mediation. There was that slight sense of battling with a shared problem, the pandemic, a shared unfamiliarity with the technology, uh, a fair amount of humor about the glitches that occurred. Uh, and uh, it, it actually gave a really interesting and different background to a lot of discussions. Um, in face-to-face -face mediation, sometimes a fire alarm goes off. The parties have to leave the building and stand on the pavement. And there is that slight sense of the parties together having averted a danger. That may sound slightly spiritual, but it's, it's a palpable thing. And then they, suddenly they're all together on the pavement in a predicament that they share. And there's that slight feeling about online mediation as well. At least there, there was at the beginning. Maybe we're getting blasé now. Uh, one of the conversations I have to have is uh, with the um, party in Paris. I say to the party in Paris, look, Mr. X is in New York. Could we start at 12 noon? Is that OK? And the party in Paris says, yes, that's absolutely fine. So they have these, have these initial discussions about timing that, again, give a feeling of collaboration, which is, uh, which is helpful and which you can build on. Accessibility. Uh, I have found that you can achieve a remarkable degree of contact and rapport over a video link. Uh, we all thought that losing face-to-face -face contact would be disastrous, but for mediation, it has worked well. And if you are sitting in front of your uh, computer, as, as, as you were all doing now, 
Uh, I can get an extremely good read, I think, of your reactions, uh, maybe a better read of your reactions than if you were sitting several meters away, surrounded by your lawyers in a, in a big conference room. Um, I have to let people into the Zoom meeting. I run the Zoom meeting. I have to let people in. I can let them in individually. I can talk to the key decision makers just for 30 seconds, minute, two minutes, right at the beginning, and have that really useful contact. And what, I, what they see when they join the call is this, because I have, a, I have a patent sign that I put up behind myself. And they, 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 when you first see them on the Zoom screen, they look lost. They look as if they're walking into an ambush. And then they see this, and they see this rather slightly ridiculous sign, and they smile. And then you're, you've, you've started. So, um, again, it's a question of adapting, but um, uh, that's, um, that's how I do it. And it, it, I find it works um, extremely well. I'll spare you that for the, for the rest of the um, submission. Um, you see people's background in people's homes if they're speaking from home. You see the pictures on the wall. Sometimes you see their children scuttling across for cover right at the beginning of the day. All of these things build up that sense of rapport. And it's a different kind of rapport, but it is a rapport nonetheless. Uh, and the fact is you can move the chess pieces around and you can have individuals meeting. You can have conferences, joint sessions. The experts can be put in a separate breakout room and you can do all of the movements of the chess pieces that you can do in a face-to-face -face mediation except for the moment when you bump into a key person by the coffee machine and you have that little random conversation that can make all the difference that we haven't yet replicated on zoom um limitations i said acce accessibility was one of the advantages but there's a but there are certainly situations where you really do need and you wish you had face-to-face -face contact the first case i mediated after the new regime came into place and the first Zoom mediation I did was a claim by a widow whose husband had committed suicide while he was performing a very high stress, high executive position in a big organization. She was suing the organization for failing to um, discharge its duty of care to her husband. Very emotional case. She was sitting on her own in her home her children were elsewhere in the house, but didn't know what was happening. She had no lawyers with her. I couldn't talk to her except on the screen. And I mean, it's, it's an extreme example, but uh, if ever there was a case where you needed people to be physically present, not least her own team around her, that was it. Um, in, in addition, uh, recent cases, the case I did in Abu Dhabi, I was very conscious of cultural differences that were much easier to, to recognize and acknowledge uh, than they would have been uh, online, much easier. Uh, well, I hope we dealt with them, but, but we certainly had a better chance of doing so by being face-to-face. -face. And recently in Edinburgh, uh, I had a face-to-face -face, uh, mediation between two former co collaborators been working together. The meeting that they had, eye to eye, re-established some degree of trust and respect uh, between them, and that was absolutely essential to that um, process working. Had they done it online? Possibly, I, I don't know, but um, uh, it certainly was helpful that we were there. Engagement. The online Zoom experience can seem less special than the mediation where the parties physically gather at a single place, they attend, they show their commitment simply by being there, making eye contact, they've given up the day. Uh, and the idea is that the settlement happens on the day. Zoom mediations can seem like just another Zoom call to the decision makers, I think. Can seem like just another Zoom call. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't know how you deal with that. I like to become, I like to dress quite formally. I like to stress the kind of process position in relation to confidentiality and so on. I try and make the day seem special. But um, I suppose there's, there's something about, about a lack of engagement. Maybe we're all used to tuning out when politicians we don't agree with are on the screen. Maybe it's something about screen-based information that we're used to be but being, you know, allowing it to wash over us and not really pay much attention. Maybe we're less good at listening. Uh, we just have to try and keep the energy levels up, which is what I consistently try to do, uh, and keep people I I engaged on, on that basis. Um, Many rem remote mediations now involve a conference room full of people sharing a standard sound and video link. 
Uh, this is much less satisfactory. It's very hard sometimes to tell whether the group of pixels in the corner is general counsel or a water cooler or a piece of furniture. I mean, you, you, sometimes the picture is really not very good and the sound is usually worse as well. Uh, if, if I can, I recommend people to get onto their single laptop cameras, uh, even if they are in a room together. You have, then have some sound and feedback issues, but they're all soluble uh, and it's infinitely, infinitely better to, to do it that way. Um, energy. Online mediation is intensely tiring. I sometimes say to people, you will feel this evening as if you've watched a box set of The Sopranos without getting up from your um, chair. Uh, the effect is that parties seem to move to offers more quickly. Mediations are shorter. So in the example I gave a moment ago of the mediation that starts late European time to cater for a, 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 a party in New York, that frequently will run from 12 until 5 or 6 because 5 or 6 the English parties all get a bit tired and, and anyway, the process as a whole eats up much more energy. Give them lots of breaks. I think Nadja referred to this. Give them lots of breaks. Say to them, I won't need to talk to you for half an hour. Leave your screen, walk away, go and have a walk outside, go and have a cup of tea, something like, I want to see you again at 12.30 or, or, or whatever it is. Um, practical tips, practical tips. Be competent with the technology. Uh, when people say to me, gosh, Bill, uh, I can tell you're not a millennial, but you seem quite good at this. That for me is a, a moment of high achievement. Uh, when you start, do a lot of practicing with two computers. On one computer, you're the mediator. On the other computer, you're the party. So you have the experience of not only moving people from room to room, but being moved. And you know, you can see what those two screens look like. So when parties say, Bill, what do we do? How do we get to our breakout room? What button do we press? You know the answer. And that is important. Tip two, maintain contact on text with the parties and text and email, but text particularly. Incredibly useful. It allows you to warn them when you're about to enter their private room. Uh, and it's also a really good side channel for conversation. Typically, I'll have the mobile numbers of the lead lawyers on each side. Uh, 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 and I can ring them at crucial points and say, listen, I just need to check one thing with you. Will your party, agree, will your client agree X, whatever it is? Um, an amusing consequence of that is that during joint sessions, I'll get text commentary from one side who will say things like, Bill, can you shut this guy up? He's talking absolute rubbish and, and so on, and this sort of thing. So there's a whole separate world of communication going on through text, and it's e extremely useful. Um, an another tip, which again is obvious, is please don't use the camera which is hidden just behind the keypad on your laptop so that we're staring up into your face from below. Get your camera, however you do it, whether you put the laptop up on books or whatever you do, get the laptop up to uh, eye height. Um, uh, that's inf infinitely preferable. Um, just a few concluding remarks. If, if settlement is the name of the game, then online mediation has been just as successful as face-to-face -face mediation. And in my experience, just as high a proportion of cases that do not settle on the day, settle shortly afterwards, which of course is an increasing modern phenomenon in mediation, uh, online mediation works, it's here to stay, um, uh, and even if the pandemic subsides and vanishes tomorrow, I think we're going to be using it um, uh, a great deal. James, those are, those are my, most of my thoughts. Thank you very much, Bill. That was a, a wonderful overview and very, very practical. Um, I now like to step back a little bit and think about really a theme that's run through the presentation so far, which is fairness. So I'd like to talk a little bit about fairness and standards. For that, I'll turn to Ann Karen. Um, Ann Karen, how is procedural fairness safeguarded in online mediation? Um, hi, hi, James. Uh, good evening, Japan. Good morning, still in Europe. I'm also very honored to join the discussion today from Austria. Um, fairness in online mediation. Uh, fairness, in my experience, is an issue that is frequently raised by people participating in online dispute resolution processes. And uh, very clearly, um, I think we need to take a step back to really understand what we mean when we say fairness in online mediation. 
what we're doing in mediation sessions is actually assist parties to negotiate. And uh, we need to be aware that there's different approaches to negotiation. So there's either the distributive or the integrative approach. Uh, distributive approaches look at the problems as a zero sum game. We all know that the re resources are imagined as being fixed. And opposite to that, we have the integrative approaches where the problems are looked at in a much broader manner and potential solutions are um, imagined uh, to be something that's probably beyond the obvious. So we're trying to expand the pie, if you will, before we start distributing. Um, why do I mention those very basics? I do so because I feel that um, that, that, that lens of, of fairness is always applied in both these approaches. For example, with the integrative uh, approach, we very often uh, see parties express that their interest is uh, being treated fairly or um, fairness is used as an objective criteria um, to, to assess any potential agreement. And even in a distributive approach, we see that parties say, well, you know, splitting whatever is on the table in the middle, that to us is a fair approach. So what I'm trying to get across to you by mentioning all of that is, is that fairness um, is not only about procedure, but also very much about outcomes. But uh, when we look at procedure in particular, I think there are some factors that we, the mediators, must integrate in our um, process design, if I may call it that, in order to really support negotiation processes, especially in an online setting. So my, my first factor that I would like to see represented in online mediations is really transparency. And what do I mean by that? Um, for a negotiation to be perceived as fair, the parties need to have an understanding how the decision uh, is actually taken, how it is um, created, really. So um, that, if necessary, you can replicate the process for any other problem, or you can correct it. So that's what I mean by transparency. My second uh, factor, and I cannot stress it enough, is really highlighting and clarifying the shadow of the law. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, and you know, this is a lawyer speaking to you, and uh, many of the mediation processes that I accompany have uh, legal aspects to them that, that weigh very strongly on the positions of the parties and their interests. So basically, um, I think it's advisable to really um, address legal issues in the mediation to let the parties bargain in the shadow of the law, giving them an indication what the outcome in a proper litigation or arbitration uh, process could be. This can very much influence the progress of the negotiation um, and, and, and can really also help to support fairness in the procedure. And then as a final point, probably um, discovery. Um, and, 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 and what I want to mention here is really that um, some negotiations fail because uh, there's not enough information on the table. And uh, the art is really to make uh, the exchange of information a voluntary process in mediation. So rather than coercing transparency, the mediator should find a way to get people to open up and uh, should consider ways of organizing or supporting or encouraging even information sharing. Um, these are very practical procedural issues that, that I consider pertinent in online uh, mediation or dispute resolution in general. Um, but uh, when I think of fairness, I cannot help but, at, uh, but think at the same time of trust 
and security is two also very important factors. And um, I'm afraid both trust and security are issues that the mediator is very much responsible for when we engage parties in an online mediation process. So uh, very briefly on trust, um, I think um, it is upon us to really nurture the trust of users in online mediation. And um, th this is really not an easy thing to do, uh, first of all, because technology, um, people don't uh, approach it usually uh, in a very intuitive way, and, except the younger generation probably. Um, and it has been mentioned before, uh, dispute resolution is generally viewed as a procedure or a process that requires warmth and, and human interaction and, and uh, meeting online is associated with, you know, a cold flat screen and uh, uh, perceived as distance creating. So that's a hurdle we need to take we, when we engage the parties. And um, all I want to say is really all forms of alternative dispute resolution have been faced with some opposition or distrust at any given point. So we really need to enhance our capabilities to actually enhance the method. And uh, what do I mean there? Um, high levels of trust are really generated if we can prove that online mediation works. And how do we do that? We ensure that the freeze, uh, there's no freeze of the screen while we speak, um, that uh, technology is really able to support the resolution of the dispute. Um, the, the technology gives us what we need to perform and it does not involve costs that the parties don't calculate with. And just in general, uh, online mediation must be user-friendly. And uh, when we have all that in place, uh, we can create an atmosphere where there is interpersonal trust, even in uh, a long distance scenario. And that really brings me to my last point, and that's security as a factor that plays into this uh, aspect of fairness in online mediation. And um, I want to touch on two particular issues, and that's data security and personal security. Um, on data security, I want to say that, you know, participants in online mediation must be sure that uh, the communication channels that are being used, the software, the service, the hardware, that everything um, is set up in a way that it prevents external people from hacking into the system and gaining access to non-public uh, information. And I refer to both documents that are being shared for purposes of the dispute resolution process, but also contact details. And Emmanuel Ta, in her excellent presentation, just made us aware of these safeguards that need to be built into the platforms that we're using in our processes. So cybersecurity really matters, not only in this day and age, but as a, as a general um, concern. And uh, my second point is really personal security. And this is something that is probably overlooked a little bit, but um, when we engage in mediation processes, we also have a responsibility in terms of ensuring the emotional, but also physical security of the mediation parties, participants. So if there is a risk of physical harm, because there's a really uh, strong personal dispute that we're getting involved with, um, keyword would be domestic violence. Online mediation can actually be very helpful because it creates this natural distance and avoids uh, aggression that involves physical harm. So, so statistically speaking, especially um, in, in, in such cases where there is a very high potential of physical ag aggression, um, online resolution has really been the preferred option. Um, and uh, with that, I really just want to say that um, Personally, I think I also want to be sure when I engage 
in an online uh, dispute resolution uh, procedure that uh, the system is not abusive towards me personally in the way that the, the data is not used without my permission and not used in ways I don't like. And there's no data mining or learning about conflict behaviors or learning about bargaining behavior, behaviors. So I think there are uh, platforms out there where we can be certain uh, that these kinds of abuses don't happen. And uh, as a mediator, you have a responsibility to select a platform that um, does not support abuse of any uh, kind that I just described. And with that, I would end uh, my my little presentation and, and, and my summary of the thoughts I had uh, considering fairness in, in online dispute resolution and online mediation in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised a lot of very interesting points about fairness. Something that might be particularly relevant um, given that UNSATRAL has organized this event uh, to fairness is um, standards. International standards or codes of conduct. Could I just ask a follow-up question about international standards and codes of conduct? Do you think those would be useful? What are your, what are your thoughts about those? Um, that's a tricky one because uh, usually we don't like over-regulation in our field. But on the other hand, I think uh, the global pandemic has really illustrated to all of us that we do need guidelines, especially in times of radical change. And, and uh, Bill put it very uh, aptly. He said it was a very rapid baptism. And I tend to agree, we all had to adapt very quickly. And we did. And I remember uh, receiving my first invitation to a Zoom call, I did not know how to handle it properly. And I dialed in via telephone because this was the only way I knew of how to do it. So um, my first um, uh, relevant uh, contact with a guideline for online hearings or online meetings was through the ICC. And I refer here to the ICC checklist for protocol on virtual hearings. And this was really a, a paper that I consulted uh, before I embarked on this new adventure of online mediation. And uh, all the technical tips uh, aside, there was one particular point that I appreciated and that was online etiquette. I wanted to know how to conduct myself to make the experience as, uh, as um, forthcoming and, and enjoyable as possible. And you know, it were, there were little things like, don't forget to mute your microphone. And by now, after almost two years <laughs> of the global pandemic and meeting online, this seems so obvious, but in the beginning it wasn't. So why do I mention all of that? I believe that guidelines can be very, very helpful. Um, what I've seen so far emanated mostly from the institutional context, but I think uh, also in an on ad hoc online mediation context, they can provide a really helpful guidance to the parties, especially and their counsel, that is. So um, I believe Guidelines can be a very helpful contribution in that they uh, provide positive examples of self-regulation and therefore should be welcomed. And I think my position can be summarized uh, very easily. I think my approach is what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And that would be it. Thank you very much for those very helpful and insightful comments. You talked a little bit about ad hoc mediation. The last topic that I'd like to discuss a bit is um, institutional support of mediation. And uh, for that, I will turn to Wee Ming and I will ask the question, what is the role of institutions in supporting online mediation in particular? And is there a need for tailored institutional rules or guidelines of some sort? 
Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, thanks to the organizers. A real pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, calling in from Singapore and the fact that we can have this, uh, this meeting from all over the world is just testament of how online is becoming uh, the mainstream almost. So uh, on my part, um, I think whatever that is possible to promote mediation, whether it's ad hoc or institutional, it should be promoted, right? It should be encouraged. So I, I, I'm all for ad hoc, I'm all for institutional. And, and the idea here is how do we reach clients? How do we reach parties? How do we work with lawyers to introduce mediation and to help them to see mediation as a viable option uh, to the other ADR method? Not all methods should be mediated, but I think right now more methods should be mediated than before, especially because of COVID. So just to expose myself uh, in terms of the uh, background in IBM, I think I'm the only one uh, with charts so I think that's, uh, that shows uh, my IBM background. So I'm going to share screen now with, uh, with permission from uh, James. I hope this works. Are we good? Okay. So I thought a picture tells a thousand words. And this is a picture of an online and in-person mediation that happens in Singapore not too long ago. Um, as you can see, uh, you have the mediator talking to uh, counsel who are, who are um, in person and parties are calling in from overseas. Uh, of course, those are not the actual parties because they are all confidential. So those are uh, uh, individuals that we have permission to take this photograph. But I guess you can see that this is how mediation can be um, uh, a seamless process. You have people in person, you have parties online, whether it is in a joint session, and this is a joint session with support of uh, SIMC, uh, which is um, the uh, individual you see right at the back, uh, who is there all the time and provides that, that seamless approach uh, uh, and, and, and interaction between the parties. So whether in a joint session or in private session, you have both the in-person and online experience uh, helping the parties to really focus. So as far as institutional support is concerned, what, I'm, what we're trying to do is to help the mediator really focus on the mediation, the parties focus on the uh, interests, the counsel on advising their clients, and let everything else that happens behind the scene be taken care of by the institution. So it is, it is something that we try to do whether it's before the mediation or after the mediation. And, and, and hopefully that makes it a more, a richer experience for everyone with a higher percentage of success. So I, I know uh, Bill was talking about uh, some of the cases that he has done. And, and I completely agree that uh, based on SIMC's experience, um, the success rate for hybrid online compared to in-person is very close for us. Uh, Online hybrid is about 76% and in-person is about 80%. There's still a 4% very slight difference. I don't think it's material, but it just demonstrates to us with the 200 over cases that we've done, um, uh, I think about 60% of them are online and hybrid compared to 40% in-person for this year um, because we're beginning to see some uh, parties coming back uh, in-person. Um, you can see based on those data that I provided, um, online is as successful as uh, in-person, provided that, of course, you have the right mediator, the parties are participating actively, and you have good counsel to support the whole uh, the case itself. What we have seen, and I want to just highlight here, is that with COVID, uh, SIMC has seen a threefold increase in a number of cases. So, Pre-COVID 2019, we have, we have you know, a much smaller number, but also here in 2021, we have seen an explosion of cases, a lot more cases here in SIMC being filed than before. And I think this is partly due to the parties recognizing the, the use of mediation and how it can actually help them, especially at these times. Um, the next chart I have is 
just I thought it'd be useful. I mean, and and all three of the other speakers, Nadia, Bill, and Karine, talked about Zoom. I think that is a very popular platform, and it's also a very popular platform for SIMC as well. So we have a set of Zoom clauses, as we like to call it, that help the parties to to really focus on what is important. Right, is the use of online dispute with Zoom, and you can replace that with Zoom, Blue Jeans. I think Bill mentioned that. Or, or teams, etc. So the idea here is to ensure that the parties understand that some of this risk is related to the platform itself, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Blue Jeans, and they have to recognize that there is an element of that security within Zoom that they have to be aware of. So as security, privacy, confidentiality, uh, the platform does play a part in, uh, in, in providing that. Of course, on our part, we will ensure that there is confidentiality of the information given to us. But when it is online, you have to rely on that particular uh, platform providing the necessary uh, um, uh, security. The third point that I've highlighted is that you have to ensure that also the parties understand that no other parties will attend and no other parties will be allowed to attend. And this is committed to under this agreement of mediating online. And the last point is there's no recording. That's absolutely critical. Neither do they record nor permit to a, uh, the recording by other parties. And if there are any other parties who are joining, they have to inform uh, the mediator, they have to inform the center, they have to inform the other side to ensure that everybody knows exactly who is on. And this is something that we do every time we start the mediation periodically as we continue the mediation. So next chart we have, we would recall the four Ps. I managed to get uh, four words with uh, starting with P, which is platform, procedures, process, and preparation. I'll go through this very quickly because uh, I want to catch up with the time. Time here. Platform, we talked about it, the use of uh, Zoom or any other facility, the technical briefings, I, I think uh, uh, we talked about it as well, having the backup communication. I think Bill mentioned that about, you know, being able to contact them if something goes wrong. The procedures, um, we have seen that in the uh, previous chart, we have the agreement that we need all parties to sign. We have uh, SOPs, uh, standard operations here protocols here where we want to ensure that everybody understand the confidentiality, security, and connectivity. And again, we get parties to sign up to that. The process is important. Um, there's both pre and post mediation. I'll talk a little bit about that with the last uh, example that I will give. Um, the timelines, time zones. Time zones are very important, right? As the center, you have to ensure that both sides have the right sweet spot for the mediation. Otherwise, you might get a perception that, hey, why are you favoring the other side? I have to stay up till midnight. Well, the other side is enjoying tea in the afternoon and having a chit chat. So, so you, you do have to have that parity, that neutrality, demonstrate that to the parties at the front. Um, then very quickly, preparation. Um, this is so critical. We have several of these pre-mediation conferences, first without the mediator and then with the mediator. We talk about e-bundling, sharing of documents. I think Nadia mentioned that it's just easier to have the same document appearing on screen rather than handing out sheets of paper uh, in, a, in an in-person mediation that you don't know whether on the right page, et cetera. The parties can really focus on specific clauses that are in question. Um, then communication, um, again, the use of tools and software, we have some of that to help the parties to, to, to especially when you have multi-party mediation, you need that kind of software to, to help them to be on the same uh, page uh, and, and getting that input from each one of them and make sure, making sure that they're not uh, switched off. So the last chart I have, and I think I'm quite good with time here, um, it's really a case study. I think you heard uh, Yoshi-san earlier in the, in the earlier panel. This is a, a really wonderful uh, case and example that I'd like to share. It's, it's a, um, uh, what we call a JIMC, SIMC, COVID-19 protocol case, our first. And we're very happy to report that it was successfully mediated. It's a dispute between uh, a Japanese party and an Indian party. But instead of having one mediator, which is usually the case, our protocol proposes two mediators. 
So why are two heads better than one, right? <laughs> and and we I did a uh, detailed uh, interview with the two of them. I've got the YouTube um, uh, reference there. Please feel free to, to take a look at it. It's an interesting discussion with the two of them. Um, but but the, the point is that when you have cross-border mediation, especially on screen, it, you are faced with tremendous challenges. Let me just give you uh, an example. You think of... Japanese food and Indian food, how different are they? I, I can hardly think of two foods that are at opposite end of the spectrum. And the foods represent culture. They represent who the parties are to some extent. They represent the language, the way they live, etc. The way they do business. So in this case, we were able to get two mediators, uh, Greg was Singaporean, but of Indian origin, and Yoshi, helping the parties to cross that, that, that cultural barrier. And if you hear the, uh, the, the interview itself, you will, you will hear the, what was the turning point that really helped the parties to, to reach a settlement. It was settled in six weeks, everything from the start of the mediation to the, the successful uh, mediation itself. They had three sessions, but they were able to do it in two. So wonderful success story that I'm, I'm happy to share that is completely online. And I believe that this is the way of the future. With that, I would like to hand the time back to James. Thank you very much, Weeming. Um, I regret that we have exhausted our time. So we will have to end our discussion here with hopes that we'll have a chance to continue it again uh, soon. Um, thanks to you all very much for uh, participating. And with that, I will give the floor to Takashi. Thank you, James. And Thanks to all the distinguished speakers uh, for their excellent presentations. I think we learned a lot from their experiences, from their professional experiences and insights. Uh, because of the time constraint, I will have to proceed uh, to the final stage of our forum. Um, I would like to give the floor to Director Watanabe for his closing remarks. Please, you have the floor. Okay. A good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on your time zone. I am Watanabe Naoki, Director of the Minister's Secretariat, International Affairs Division of the Japanese Ministry of Justice. I have the pleasure to address the closing of this forum. I must begin by extending my sincere gratitude to all the speakers, panelists, and moderators for their valuable contributions and to the participants for following the discussions with interest. My special thanks goes to Ms. Anna Jovan Bray, the Secretary of Anstral, and Ms. Meg Kinier, the Secretary General of ICSID, for leading our endeavors together in making this forum successfully take shape. I wish to take a moment to briefly share my key takeaways. Regarding the session on the stock taking of developments in dispute resolution in the digital economy, the discussions covered a broad range of issues relating to the use of standard technology to more advanced technology. It was stressed that there was an ever pressing need to address the issues pertaining to the flood of information, which creates serious due process and fairness concerns in the context of digitalization. The discussions on online hearings and the mediation illustrated standards being developed for the conduct of these proceedings. The usefulness of ODRs and the need to address their downsides were also discussed. The presentations on the use of advanced technologies such AIs and blockchains highlighted the need to continuously contemplate how they will fit in the field of dispute resolution or the justice sector as a whole. Based on the excellent presentations, we will be preparing a report summarizing the discussions of the sessions, which will serve as the basis for further discussions at the Anstral Working Group 2 Colloquium scheduled for late March next year. With respect to the session on the Exit Rules Amendment project, I defer to my colleague Fumihiko, who has already elaborated on the discussions which took place. The discussions were all indeed inspiring and fascinating. 
By extending my sincere thanks to everyone once again and my best wishes, I conclude my closing remarks. Thank you very much and happy holidays. On behalf of the co-organizers, thank, thank you, uh, Director Watanabe. And on behalf of the co-organizers, I extend my heartfelt thanks to distinguished panelists, speakers, and contributors to this forum and thank the attendees for their participation. We hereby successfully conclude the 2021 Tokyo Forum on Dispute Resolution. Thank you once again and wishing you all a happy holiday season.